Hey everyone, happy Sunday. Welcome to our virtual online service with Anchor Church in Buffalo. We're super glad that you're spending your Sunday morning with us. I hope that wherever you are, it's cozy and warm. It's chilly here in Buffalo, New York, but it's a great day to um, snuggle up with a cup of something warm and a good blanket um, and to learn a little bit about Jesus and how much he loves us. And I'm so glad that you're choosing to do that with us today. Um, we're so excited. Anchor Church turns five this month, which is just amazing. Um, we're well out of our toddler years and into our kindergarten year, so yay for that. Um, we are just so excited to have been, you know, anchored in hope and expressing that hope through love and service to our community for five years now. Um, it's pretty amazing. I know that Anchor has been an amazing blessing in my life and my family's life, and we're so grateful for it. And if you feel the same, we'd love for you to tell people about it on social media. So post um, on your channels and tag us. Uh, we also have our Anchor community group that we'd love for you to join to get plugged in. You can find out about things like small groups and give prayer requests. And um, sometimes when we come together outside of our morning uh, Sunday service to get together virtually and hang out, you can find out all of that there too. You can see my little kid in the background there. That's Annika. Hi, Annika. <laughs> so anyways, um, join the Anchor community group and uh, you can post about what a blessing Anchor has been in your life there as well. Um, we'd love for you to just share, uh, share with people and uh, hopefully more of them will come to join us on our virtual Sundays. If you're new here, we want to say thank you so much for joining us today. We hope that you feel inspired and we hope that you feel encouraged, but most of all, we hope that you feel really, really welcome. Um, and if you want to be even more welcome, you can get our weekly updates and occasional texts through our Anchor Loop. So it's really easy to get plugged in. You just text the word Loop, L-O-O-P, to 716-222-715. High five. My kid is being ridiculous. You know, we're not going to spam you, but it's a really great way for uh, us to be able to communicate with you and tell you the important things that are happening in the life of our church. So we hope you'll take advantage of that. We also just want to take a moment to thank you so much for your faithfulness and continued generosity and giving to Anchor Church. It really helps to sustain us, um, especially during this difficult time. And it helps us to continue to be able to reach the community and show them how we're anchored in love and hope by serving them and providing for them in ways that we can. So just a reminder, you can give uh, very easily using the Tithely app or um, on the Anchor website. Uh, you just go up to Anchor Church and uh, right up at the top, there's a little place for giving so you can do that too. So um, if you're like me and you're working from home and you've got a kid at home doing school, uh, hang in there. If you are working all the time outside of the house and you don't have any kids, but you're exhausted anyways, hang in there. If you are a teacher, if you are a frontline worker of any kind, um, if you are a stay-at-home parent, if you are a caregiver to somebody else, heck, you know what? If you are a human being in the year 2021, you are doing a great job. Hang in there. Better days are coming. Brighter days are ahead. Uh, there's so much hope. I know that a lot of us in Buffalo felt really disappointed by the Bills this weekend, or last weekend rather, but I still feel a lot of hope for them. And there's so much hope for other things too. And remember, our hope is mostly anchored in Jesus. He's always the same. Yesterday, today, tomorrow. Amen. And thank God, because what else can we hang our hats on right now, friends? Am I right? So it's time for us to transition to worship. And when we come back, Pastor Steve is going to continue our series called The Good News for Bad Christians. The best news of all, Jesus, our hope. Have a great day.
Yes, it overwhelms and satisfies my soul. And I never ever have to be afraid. This one thing remains. One Hey everybody, so glad that you joined us today. My name is Steve, I'm the pastor here, and uh, we are in week five of our series, Good News for Bad Christians. I uh, hope you've seen our other weeks, if not, um, we're just talking about the different things that though uh, we you know, have faith in Jesus and are doing our best to follow him, there's some areas of our lives that tend to be reoccurring issues, and so we're just kind of covering some of those, not to say that anybody's uh, you know, categorize as good or bad in God's eyes, but rather um, just encouraging that if you've been following Jesus for a while and you still feel like you are struggling in some areas of your life, that you're not alone. And, and we really, I don't think, have said anything that's provocative or new, but let's be honest, sometimes the best teaching we can have is just reminding us of the things that we already know. I am pretty sure today will be no different from that. Um, I bet it's going to be a reminder. I do want to start off just telling you um, about my childhood a little bit. See, I grew up with um, this condition. I don't know if you have ever suffered from it. It's called foot in mouth syndrome. I don't know if that's ever happened to you. Let me let me tell you the story. So um, I remember one time my family, uh, my mom, my brother, and myself, we were camping at this campground and our friends had a campsite right, right next door and so everybody is hanging out at night and the parents and adults they're talking and and kids are just like playing but we're around and for some reason um the parents started talking about a employee you know somebody from the, the our school like in the high school that they didn't like an administrator or teacher i don't remember who it was um, they're just talking about their frustrations and venting and whatever, complaining, I don't know, doing what doing what parents do, I don't know. Anyway, and I'm listening to this, and to me, like, I'm like, man, this is like, I maybe for some reason, I never really heard parents talk so openly or whatever, but I just was like, and I had this feeling like I wanted to be kind of in, like I wanted, I wanted to kind of join in the revelry or whatever this is, I wanted to be a part of it, and so I remember... Uh, jumping in and I was like you know who's really bad and so all the parents look at me and so I start going off I'm like oh there's this guy and you know he's an assistant coach and like but in gym class this is what he does and like nobody likes him and actually when nobody's looking this is what all the students say about him and as we're saying that one of the moms is like just looking at me and, and I could tell like the other parents they're not they're not with me okay um as I'm speaking, I just get this feeling like something bad is happening. And uh, so I finish what I'm saying, and the one particular mother or says, Oh, like, or I don't know if she was one of the moms, but she was family. She was friends of a friend. I don't know. Anyway, she was there. And she's like, Oh, really? Is that what they else? I'm like, Yeah. She's like, <clears throat> um, That's my son. 
And like, uh, I just, I hope you're cringing. I cringe just <clears throat> thinking about it. It was so awful. I was so embarrassed. My mom was embarrassed and, and pretty angry. And it just like, I thought I was being so cool. Um, but I was not being cool. And, and it backfired, foot in mouth. Um, I don't know if that's ever happened to you. But we have a tendency um, to get ourselves in troubles with, with our mouths, with the things we say. And so as we continue on in our series, Good News for Bad Christians, we're going to be talking about that. We're going to be talking about the power of our words. Um, because honestly, sometimes you and I, we can say some really stupid things, things that we wish we could take back. We could hit a rewind button or redo. And if you've been a, a part of our church for any length of time, then you know that I am not immune um, to this foot and mouth syndrome. Every now and then, not intentionally, I just, words fly out of my mouth before maybe I think them through. Even though I try really, really hard not to let that happen, I try, especially when preaching, to be um, very intentional with my words, especially when speaking about the nature and character of God. But it happens. Now, what's worse than saying something stupid is saying something, at least in my opinion, worse than saying something stupid is sometimes I say something that's hurtful to the people that I really love. And that's not good. And, and have you ever noticed it's, it's the ones that you love the most that sometimes are the ones you say the most hurtful things to? Maybe in an argument or, or maybe something... If you've said to your kids in a moment of, you know, when you lost your patience or lost your cool, and you just wish that you could take those words back. You wish you could, like, wipe their memories clean. Today we're going to be getting in some really good advice from James, the brother of Jesus. By the way, whenever I bring up James, I always have to mention the fact that um, if you're skeptical of Christianity consider this. James, the person we're going to be reading today, was Jesus' biological brother. And during Jesus' life in ministry, James was not a follower of Jesus. He didn't buy into it. I mean, what would it take for you to believe that your brother was the Messiah, the Son of God? It would take a lot, right? Same thing with James. He's like, all right, I think you've gone crazy. But suddenly, after Jesus' death, burial and resurrection, James becomes a follower of Jesus. James begins preaching that Jesus is the Son of God, that he's the Messiah, and that people should have faith in him and follow him and live for him. Think what it would take for you to believe that about your sibling. Anyway, I always have to say that with James because it's such an amazing kind of like just a little something to pause and think about. But anyway, consider James. But today we're going to be listening to James because he's got some advice for you and I today, especially when it comes to our mouths and, and the effect that our words have and a different way of looking at our words um, and how they affect the people around us. So if you want, uh, you could turn to James 3. You can use an app. You can use the browser, whatever you got, okay? Um, James 3. And um, just to preface this passage... This is one of those messages, and this is one of those passages where it's like a lot of bad news. Like it's like bad news, tougher news, tougher news, and then there's good news at the end. So please hang on. Um, this isn't going to be, you know, a an entire service of talking about how destructive we are. Okay, there's going to be good news at the end. I just want to let you know that that's the case. Okay, um, but the first thing I want us to know is is this: that my tongue can speak words that deeply wound the people that I love most. That's the first thing we have to recognize. I think you know that that's in, intuitively and through experience. I think you know that's true. There's no happy way to say that, right? It's just true. Um, words have incredible power to hurt those around us. James is going to point uh, that out for us today. If we look at James, again, uh, chapter 3, starting in verse 2. This is what it says. For all of us make many mistakes. Anyone who makes no mistakes in speaking is perfect, able to keep the whole body in check with a bridle. If we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we guide their whole bodies. 
or look at ships. Though they are so large that it takes strong winds to drive them, yet they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the, w the will of the pilot directs. So, so he starts off by giving two analogy for our tongues, for our words. And it's pretty straightforward, right? And, and that even in, uh, in just a few words that come out of our mouths, it can change a lot, right? A few words can change the whole direction of a meeting. A, a few angry words can be, uh, you know, thrown out there, can make family, our family dinner very, very awkward, right? You've been there. So what is he saying? Not only does our tongue have the power to wound people we love, its power to destroy, this is our second point, our power to destroy is disproportionate to its size. The power of our, our tongue uh, is to destroy is, is disproportionate to its size, right? Verse 5, For also, uh, so also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great exploits. How great a forest is set ablaze by a small fire. Listen, if you've been watching the news for the last couple of years, you know, right? Considering what we've seen in, in California or last year in Oregon, over the last years, uh, it's not too hard to envision that, right? We all know that a very small spark can start a blaze that wipes out millions of acres of forest. And you and I know this. It doesn't, it doesn't take much of something bad to ruin something that's good. A, a little bit of rat poison um, will ruin a very good burrito, even if it's the size of your head. Okay? And this is what James is getting at. Now, he's overkilling it here with the analogies, but, but he wants to make sure that we understand how much power we're talking about here. He really is driving it home um, how much a few words can destroy our day. I mean, think about it at work, right? Um, your boss says something rude to you, or, or maybe he's careless in his critique or, or what he says. So, so you go home, and, and as you do, as you're driving, you're just stewing on those words. And, and then you get home, and, and then you're, maybe you're just a little short or grumpy, and, and you have short words with your husband. And then, and then he gets mad, and then he you know, goes upstairs, and then he says something rude or short to, with, with your son. And then the son starts bugging the sister because he's all perturbed. And then the sister slams the door on the brother, but the cat was in the doorway and his tail gets smashed. And then um, because of that, the cat screams, jets, and swipes at the dog. The dog bumps the table. The lamp falls off and shatters all because of a guy who doesn't even live in the house, right? So listen, next time you're at work and somebody says something and it, and it bugs you, just go home and break a lamp and, and just save everybody in the middle, okay? Okay, maybe maybe don't do that. But, but you get the point. A few careless words from one person has a domino effect on many people, many people. And that's what James is trying to make, make the point of, is just um, this little tongue can destroy things, and it's disproportionate to its size. He continues, actually, to drive this point home in verse 6. Let's look. And the tongue is a fire. The tongue is placed among our members as a world of iniquity. It stains the whole body, set on fire the cycle of nature, and is itself set on fire by hell. All right, James. <laughs> Getting the point, bro. Settle down. We get it. He's saying, no, you don't. You don't. You don't even realize the words that you speak. Words, words that you forget that you even said. Right? You don't know what they do. Listen, I bet almost everybody here listening to my voice right now can think of some words that were spoken to you or about you when you were a kid. And they still play in your head on that negative mixtape that you hear in your mind. Tell me I'm wrong. James says... Don't minimize the power of your words to corrupt everything around you. The next thing we see here is that your tongue is able to corrupt your whole life. And here's the real, real bad news. You can't tame it. That's, that's pretty dark, right? 
I mean, it's it's, it's bad. Okay. <laughs> your your words can hurt people. That's bad. Uh, no, no, no. Your words can destroy and corrupt way beyond anything you can imagine. Okay, that's really bad. And then James adds on top, and you can't control it. Let's look at verse 7. For every species of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by the human species, but no one can tame the tongue, a restless evil full of deadly poison. So James, you know, he's being hyperbolic. James is saying that our tongue is very powerful, steers the whole course of our life. Okay. Oh, also, you can't tame it. You're powerless to control it. It, it, it steers your whole life, but you can't control it. And let's be honest. We know that's kind of true, right? Like, imagine this. Just to understand why James is saying this, why it's so important. Imagine one day you get up. It's time to go to work. You get in the garage, start the car. Hopefully you have warm, you know, seat warmers because it's cold right now. Um, but before you back out, the steering wheel falls off. But not to be deterred. Um, you put it in reverse. You back up anyway. But here's the problem is when you parked the car the night before, you would turn the wheel just a little bit. Now you get out the, the driveway and, and down most of, you know, out of the garage down the driveway. But next thing you know, this curve takes you. And next thing you know, you hit a car on the street but you have good insurance. So instead of stopping, and, and even though you don't have a steering wheel, um, you you get out of your car, and you start tugging on your tires, and you, you try to aim the tires toward the end of your street. You get in the car, you drive. But you were a little bit off, so, so you hit a tree. So you, you back up, you, you get out, you adjust the tires a little bit more, and then you, you keep it. Imagine that's how you had to drive to work. And then imagine that everybody else was doing that as well. Can you imagine the chaos? If you're having trouble doing that, just imagine, or just look really at the world around us and how people use their words. Because that's what it's like right now, right? That's, that's what reality is like when it comes to our words. And people are out of control. They, 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 they're trying to adjust and they're doing their best. But let's be honest. They're not. They're not controlling their mouths. They're not controlling their words. And it's causing great damage. That, that's the reality we live in. Our tongues are small but powerful. And they have the power to corrupt and cause pain to those who you love most. And no one can control this tongue. So, bad news that gets to worse news to worse. But, but listen, like I said in the beginning, there's some good news here as well. Okay? You know what, do you want to know what the good news is? I bet you know what it is. Because again, I'm not telling you anything you haven't heard before. And I recognize that. But we still need to hear it, right? The good news is this. With God's help, my words can bring healing and encouragement. My words, your words, they can bring hope, healing, and encouragement. Proverbs 18.21 says this, The tongue has the power of life and death. Both are possible, right? Without God, your tongue will be used to bring death, even when you don't want it to. I, I was looking at my, uh, it reminded me actually of something, I was looking at my uh, wedding ring. Normally, we, uh, Lindsay and I, take our wedding rings to the jeweler to get it, um, like, rhodium plated or whatever like that on a regular basis, and they check it and stuff. And it's under warranty forever as long as we take them in. But, um, you know, that hasn't happened in quite a while. Um, and I remember the day, obviously, our, my wedding day, I remember when these rings were real new. And, you know, they, they were just perfect, shining, and, and they were just like our, really a metaphor for our relationship. Everything was new and shiny and good. Um, but over time, over time, these rings have gotten worn. There's nicks and scratches from, from being beat up and being on hands that are, that are careless and doing whatever. 
And isn't that the perfect metaphor for a lot of our relationships when it comes to our words? We start off, um, you know, we make these vows thinking, why do we even need to make them? Of course, we're going to treat each other this way. But then over time, through careless use of words and through arguments, we, we scratch and nick each other's souls with how we speak and what we say, sometimes what we don't say. Isn't that true? Listen, the longer you are in a, in the long, the longer you're in a relationship and the more you love, uh, the more you are at risk of scratching and nicking and doing damage to the one you love. But we have a God and he is like a jeweler and he can polish and he can clean and he can restore. And God gives us the ability to speak life into people. The very people that you love and, and that you've hurt with your words, God, you know, with his help, you can begin to speak life and love and healing into those people. Proverbs 16.24 says, pleasant, are wor pleasant words are a honeycomb, sweet to the soul and healing to the bones. Think about that. You can speak things that can bring healing to people. The same tongue that can cause damage to a young child can be undone by healing words, encouraging words, by speaking life into them. And if you ask God, God would, uh, you know, would help you and I not only to not use our words to hurt, but to actually bring life. That's an amazing thing when you think about it. God could be using you in your circle of friends or in, in, in your household and, and in your, at your school or, or at your job. He could, he could be using you in those places to actually bring real healing to people. That's incredible. And if you're the kind of person that, um, that encourages and speaks life into people, listen, you'll be sought out. In a sea of negativity and cynicism, if you're the one speaking life, you will change things around you. And I do need to always preface, or I need to stop and say, listen, that doesn't mean that we avoid difficult conversations or talking about the ugly things that are happening in the world. We definitely need to do that. But we can do that. And we can use our tongue in such a way that we don't kill the ones who hear us, right? Within the past few weeks, I've had some difficult conversations. I've had to respond to some politically charged emails, okay? And I had to take extra time to choose my words, to edit my words, to, to delete sentences, to curb my desire to get a jab in, to, to avoid... My ego that wants to look smart. The one-liner that, that could be dismissive to the other person's point of view. Listen, with God's help, we can be people who bring healing and encouragement. And my last thought, guys, is this. To, to change my speech. First, God must change my heart. God doesn't do superficial work in our lives, okay? He changes us from the inside out. And if, if you want your speech to change, you have to invite God into your life and ask him to change your heart. To go back to Proverbs again, chapter 16, verse 23, a wise man's heart guides his mouth. His heart guides his speech. Proverbs also says a foolish person who speaks foolish words does so from his heart. Or the best yet, I think, is in Luke 6, 45. The good person out of the good treasure of the heart produces good. And the evil person out of evil treasure produces evil. This is it, guys. For it is out of the abundance of the heart that the mouth speaks. Listen, when I was younger... I don't know about you guys. I wanted to sound smart. I wanted to sound cool. I wanted people to think well of me. As I've gotten older, what I realize is this. It's not, it's not about um, having the perfect words, but having the right heart. Because listen, 
you can use the right words and still be, and it can be shallow flattery, right? Have you ever had that happen to you? Somebody's really nice to you and then afterwards you realize that there was a reason for it? Or ever have somebody invite you over to for dinner and they shower you with compliments and, and they're making you feel so good about yourself and you're like, wow, this person thinks I'm amazing. And then after dinner, they pull out a notebook and they're like, hey, I just want to share with you this really unique opportunity. And you're like, you've got to be kidding me. You're selling me something? Have you ever had that happen to you? Like, okay, fine, you're trying to sell me something, but were all those things true or not? Listen, I know that you've probably been in those situations before where you know what it's like to have somebody say nice words to you, but you know it's not actually coming from their heart. They're just wanting to impress you or wanting to sell you something. We don't just want to fix our words, my friends. We want to fix our hearts. Because we're all going to end up saying something at times that are not thoughtful or they're unintentionally hurtful. No matter what kind of person you are, Mother Teresa probably offended somebody on accident. It's going to happen because you and I are uh, limited in our understanding and our vocabulary and our perspectives, like, it's just we are limited, finite creatures. But what happens when somebody who has a fully and loving heart says something wrong, we receive it differently, right? It doesn't cut as deep because we know their intentions. And I just want to leave you with this thought. The world needs more Christians who don't just have a bunch of pleasant words, but has a heart of love for every person they meet. It's not going to be our words that make people think differently, all right? Right now, we, there's a reputation, right? The Christians are unloving and often hypocritical. We need to have a renovation of our heart. And if we do that, people will see it. And when we mess up our words, which we will, people will know that our intentions are good and pure, and loving. Because people are smart. People aren't stupid. So, we're going to go into worship, and when we come back, I'd love to pray for us all, you and me, that God would do a work in our heart, and to help us to, to bring control, to rein in this thing that has so much power in our lives, and in our world. I'll see you in just a minute. Your love is stirring Like a ring of solid gold Like a vow that is tested Like a covenant of old Your love is enduring Through the winter rain And beyond the horizon With mercy for two Makes us whole, and you 
shoulder our weakness and your strength becomes our own you're making me like you clothing me in white bringing beauty from ashes for you will have your bride free of all her guilt and rid of and known by her true name and it's why I sing your praise may ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise may ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise may ever be on my lips ever be your praise ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise ever be on my lips ever be your praise ever be on my lips ever be on my and you will be praised you will be praised with angels and saints we sing worthy are you Lord and you will be praised you will be Well, I am so glad that you were here today. Um, I don't know what's been on your mind. Maybe you've been thinking about a particular person or situation um, where you know that your words have done damage, and, and maybe that's just been weighing heavy on you. We'll pray right now um, that not only you know for forgiveness for that, but for God to enable you to restore and reconcile and, and bring healing to wounds. But I do. I want to do more than just say sorry for, for not being a good Christian or for being a bad person or being hurtful with my words. I want to do more than just always being apologizing for, for the bad things. Don't you? I want God to enable you and me to do more of the good. I want us to be a church of people who are bringing healing into this world. Healing into people's lives and encouragement. 
I am guilty, and I bet some of you two are too at this point, of just being cynical, always having the sarcastic reply. And, and while that's not the most evil thing that's ever happened or, or said, I don't know if that's what the world needs more of right now, huh? I'm just going to pray that God would help us, that he'd renovate our hearts and help you and I to be a part of doing something so good. Let's pray. God, we come to you in the name of Jesus. We thank you, Father, for your great love for us and your patience. You've given us the ability to speak. And just like you spoke creation into existence, our worlds, or our words can create. They can also destroy. They can bring death or they can bring life. God, for the time that we have been careless with our words or intentionally damaging with them, when we've used words as a weapon or used our words to, um, to speak poorly of people that you love and sent your son to die for. God, when we've been dismissive and disrespectful, God, for those things, we are sorry. We truly are. And God, we recognize that's not what you want for us. And God, we also recognize that we've caused damage. Help us to reconcile and restore those, those wounds. Help us to bring healing to relationships where we need to. God, help us and, and, um, to, to make things right. And God, we recognize that it's more than just about filtering our words or just keeping bad things from coming out, but rather by addressing the source. God, we have a heart problem where our heart is selfish. Our heart is often um, leading us to say and think the worst of people. And so, God, we pray that you would do a renovation in our heart, that we'd begin to love people the way you do, and that, God, out of the overflow of this loving heart would come words that heal and encourage and restore. So, God, this is our prayer. We pray it humbly and trusting in you and the power of your Son, Jesus. We thank you, God. We again invite your spirit into our lives to do a new thing, and we thank you for it. We pray it in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Well, thank you for joining us again. Um, I hope this is an encouragement to you. I hope you feel challenged and inspired, and more than anything, I just hope you sense that God is with you, and he is ready to do something new in your life, okay? And I hope to see you um, again next week, okay, friends? Take care of yourselves and your families and, and the people around you, and, um, and we'll see you real soon. Grace and peace, friends.